been a great honor to chair the second phase of the IBA Presidential Task Force on the Global Financial Crisis. Few issues are as pressing as the more than a billion people living in poverty. Nobody bailed out the poor. It is recognized that poverty is man-made and human beings can solve it and that we have many, if not all, of the resources and ingenuity to tackle poverty. The book, Poverty, Justice, and the Rule of Law, which I had the privilege to co-edit with Neil Gold, is the report of this phase, but just a first step in dealing with this large issue. The book consists of 14 chapters covering a wide spectrum of brilliant contributions, such as those of four Nobel laureates, Mohammed Yunus, Amartya Sen, James Heckman and Joseph Stiglitz, who notably, in all their respective fields, have shown ways to tackle poverty. In the film that follows, Nobel laureates Mohammed Yunus and Joseph Stiglitz, keynote speakers at the IBA's annual conference in Dublin, share their analysis of the financial crisis and its impact on poverty. Also Mark Malak Brown, former UN Deputy Secretary General and author of the Millennium Development Goals, and Professor Thomas Poggi, Director of Yale's Global Justice Program, suggest urgent solutions, including the role lawyers can play. The financial crisis is a very strange uh, kind of phenomenon that took place. Uh, it took place, it's, it's almost like a, an earthquake uh, which shook the whole world. But the epicenter of the earthquake is one country. Uh, to be more specific, probably one city. Something happened in one city, it shook the whole world. This shows how vulnerable the whole economic system is. And in that one city, probably few people who made those decisions and turned around and made everything happen uh, in waves to uh, people lose their jobs, factories closed down, and economies collapsing, and all those kind of things. So that's not a very happy kind of uh, thing to see, that uh, all the power is concentrated in few places or few uh, business houses. The laws of capitalism uh, in market economy say that it, uh, you, 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 you bear risk, you get returns when things are well, and you bear the cost of the downside. Mm -hmm. And it's what I've called airsocks capitalism, where you walk off with the upside, but society bears the losses. That's mm -hmm. not capitalism. It's a violation of the rule of law because we had laws mm -hmm. that to deal with banks that could not meet their financial obligations. And when their, when their uh, level of capitalization falls too low, we have a process called conservatorship. Mm -hmm. So we put into place laws to deal with the problems of Citibank and Bank America, and we walked away. Mm -hmm. uh, we bailed them out rather than follow the rule of law. One simple fact is poverty is not created by the poor people. It's not because of something lacking in them they became poor. Uh, it's because of the system which was not available to them. Uh, they fell through the system, and that's what created the poverty, and they cannot link themselves up to the system to go uh, upwards. It's not there. So we need to address that. Institutions are designed wrongly. It works for the privileged people. It doesn't work for the poor people. Like, take the example of the banks. Banks don't give lend money to the poor people. That's how loan sharks flourish everywhere in the world. The, uh Evidence is overwhelming that this is going to deepen the downturn uh, and uh, unemployment will be higher, the economy weaker, the benefits in terms of revenues will be disappointing because as the economy gets weaker, tax revenues go down, unemployment insurance goes up. Now, in the case of some small countries, they had no choice. Greece, for instance. It, it, it had no access to financial markets. One way or the other, it, it, it would have to adjust its budget. When we are in the deepest of the crisis, this is the greatest of the opportunity. Maybe we are missing it out. We have to do that. We have to redesign the whole system so that we don't have the food crisis, 
We don't have the energy crisis. We don't have the financial crisis. We don't have the employment crisis and name it, poverty and so on. Mm -hmm. We have to address this as a whole, not just bits and pieces here, always kind of doing another mandate here, another mandate there. That thing, I think, is dragging us to a more disaster. Lawyers have a natural inclination to be in support of the rule of law. I mean, if, the, if lawyers aren't in favor of the rule of law, who is? And part of the rule of law has always been not just laws, uh, because laws that support the rich at the expense of the poor, the powerful at the expense of the weak, is not a, what we mean by a rule of law. Uh, that's an oligarchy, a plutocracy. What the rule of law is, everybody's level. The law that creates the bank, which is the bank for the rich, uh, is a different kind of uh, animal you create with that law. It's a bank for the rich. So you need a different kind of legal framework to create the bank for the poor. And many people introduced me as a banker to the poor. I said, I, I'm very happy with this description. I'm called banker to the poor. But my question is, how would you designate the other bankers? How do you call them? Just plain bankers? Or are they really bankers to the rich? So uh, there is a two different kinds of banking now, banker to the rich and banker to the poor. So I said, if that is so, uh, banker to the rich has a law to create a bank. That law creates only banker to the, uh, bank to, for the rich. I said, why don't we create a law for bank for the poor? I always supported it right from the beginning when it mm. was announced. I thought this is the best thing the United Nations ever did. This is the best thing mankind as a whole ever did to itself. Uh, these are very clearly defined goals. There are eight in numbers and as a deadline, 2015. Uh, then you can compare whether you are moving in that direction or not moving in that direction. Mm. And I'm happy that Bangladesh uh, is very much at par with the progress uh, to make the uh, Millennium Development Goals happen, particularly on the goal number one, this, um, achieving, uh, reducing poverty by half by 2015. We are very much on the track right now. Mm -hmm. uh, if uh, European crisis didn't take place, financial crisis didn't take place, probably would be far ahead of the 2015 would have achieved that. But today still, with all those crises, all those difficulties that imposes on us because of the crisis in Europe and United States, uh, still we are on track to achieve that goal. Eradicating poverty continues to be a central challenge of our time. The world has the resources to do so, but well over one billion people still struggle to survive on less than one dollar per day. Also, the book is particularly timely because of the deadline for the Millennium Development Goals of 2015. And the discussion has begun of what to do post-2015. You know, we have trade policies which remain skewed against poor countries. Um, uh, whether it is agricultural subsidies, you know, we, we a cow in Europe gets a two dollar a day subsidy essentially which looks pretty rich to uh, uh, one of the world's billion who are living on less than a dollar a day and there are you know the issues of, 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 of copyright and affordable uh, R&D and medicines and IT systems for poor countries. What we should do as we think about the MDG successors is we should try to move from detached goals, which are nobody's goal in particular, just it would be nice if blah blah happened, to real concrete goals that are attached to particular agents such as governments in such a way that when we move off the glide path, when we do less well than we ought to be doing, Specific agents have specific concrete responsibilities to take specific actions in order to get us back onto the glide path. So what I would plead for is a series of institutional reform goals that should take the place of the MDGs as we move beyond 2015. And some examples of these, and many of them quite relevant to lawyers, some examples of these are that we should at least tax trade-distorting subventions 
for poverty eradication purposes, such as, for example, subsidies in agriculture, export credits, and so on. A certain fraction of the value of these subsidies should be put into a humanitarian development fund used specifically for development. We should have a tax or fee on greenhouse gas emissions to which poor populations are the most vulnerable. We should also have a global tax on arms exports, certainly into the developing countries. These weapons do an enormous amount of harm. We should have an alternative minimum tax on the profits of multinational corporations, often multinational corporations because 60% of world trade is internal to companies. They can shift by intelligent pricing their profits into those jurisdictions where tax rates are lowest and thereby avoid or evade most taxes altogether. We should make sure that all corporations pay at least something, some minimum like 10% on their corporate profits, regardless of how much they pay to the various nations. And again, that could go into a humanitarian development fund. Uh, we should end accounts with unknown owners or beneficiaries, these $23 trillion which are unaccounted for lying somewhere in secrecy jurisdictions and tax havens where nobody knows who owns that money and certainly no taxes are paid on it. We should try to limit the discretion that unrepresentative rulers have to borrow money in the name of their country, money that then has to be repaid by the population of the country that first suffered from the dictatorial rule and then has to pay the cost of that rule when the ruler is finally gone. We should do the same with the natural resources that are sold by such rulers uh, that are not representative of the people. And finally, we should try to find alternative ways of rewarding innovation, not through markup of you know, high prices, for example, in the area of medicines, but rather to reward innovation in medicines and in other important areas by paying for the actual health impact, the actual results, the actual performance of an innovation. We clearly are falling down and what I found so interesting is that when, for instance, the United States, which always emphasized political rights and to the expense of economic rights, mm -hmm. when it finally started talking about economic rights, it was the economic rights of corporations not the economic rights of individuals. So mm -hmm. it talked about the rights of capital to move freely across borders. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, far more important is the right, right of an individual to access to health care, to live, uh, which is sort of one of the rights that is basically recognized. Now, different countries, different standards of living, the interpretation of those rights will be obviously have to be adjusted. But the reason I emphasize the Declaration of Human Rights is it represents a broad consensus across humanity of what are some basic rights of individuals. One of the, the uh, ironies of the current situation is that we have, on the one hand, underutilized resources, and we have, on the other hand, huge unmet needs, needs for restructuring the economy, uh, retrofitting the global economy for global warming, addressing uh, uh, in infrastructure needs in, in Africa, fighting poverty, even at home, education, technology. So this would provide a source of global demand mm. if we could recycle some of the money that's not being spent to create more global demand and we'd all benefit from it. And so, the book Poverty, Justice and the Rule of Law provocatively pushes the boundaries and sets new parameters. The book has also given rise to the working group of the Rule of Law Action Group entitled Poverty, Empowerment and the Rule of Law. That working group aims to fill a niche of identifying and advocating innovative ways to end poverty. The good news is that lawyers individually and as a profession can take practical steps to refocus the solution of the global financial crisis properly as a global human crisis. We can also realign the conventional notions of justice and the rule of law. 
isn't a supportive and sustainable environment for human development a vital part of the rule of law? Thank you.